Thank you, Brother Michael. We will turn in our Bibles to the New Testament. and We will start in a series this morning. I feel like we ought to look at another portion of the Scripture right now. So we'll be going to the book of Matthew, if you would, please. Book of Matthew. We'll be looking at uh, Matthew chapter number 5, if you would, please, with me. We'll read a few verses of Scripture and then get right on into the, to the lesson. Matthew chapter number 5. <clears throat> the Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was sent, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecute they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I would like for us to look at the Beatitudes and uh, study them just for a little bit. I've entitled a series on how to be a happy Christian, and we'll look a little bit more into it, but today we'll kind of be an introduction into this study. We have a few weeks of study coming up. Uh, we'll look at verse number one and verse number two today. The word, I want to say this before we get into it, the word blessed, it means more than happy. It means more than just blessed. It's, it's really hard in the English language to get the significance of the word blessed. The best I can come up with or the best I can find and come to conclusion is this blessed person is a person who has the smile of God on their life. That, I think that's about what it is. And I want to look at the first couple of verses and we'll study this and then get right into it. I believe it would be a blessing for you and for me to see this and have this study. The Bible says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then he does the Beatitudes. If you want to know what this, these are, these are the open, opening comments of one of, if not the greatest, which probably is the greatest message ever heard by a mortal man. It's the message better known as the Sermon on the Mount. It starts right here in this. It includes the Beatitudes, the Golden Rule. It includes the model prayer. Some people call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's the model prayer, etc. Alive in this sermon, I guess you could say, is the summation of the teachings of Jesus Christ on how to be a ha have a happy life and as a born again Christian. The message, this message, goes beyond the law. It presents the Christian discipleship that can be formed in the soul of an individual only by the power of God. And it's God that makes a person that's saved and trying to live a godly life happy and content in it. It doesn't tell you this, these, these beatitudes and these, it doesn't tell you how to be saved, but it tells you what it is to be saved, which is a lot different. Well, the Sermon on the Mount explains the quality of a man's life that is changed by the saving grace of God and these, these truths are found in these, these next chapters. 
and repeated everywhere in the New Testament. You can find them all over the place. But I guess you could say the most basic and foundational truth that's found, or fundamental truth that's found in the Beatitudes would probably be, uh, and the Sermon on the Mount, would probably be the just shall live by faith. These truths, I guess, were the benchmark or the target for every Christian to shoot for, that we live by faith. It's the basically the conduct of a Christian that which is considered what we would consider Christian. As we approach these verses, we need to understand that the ability to leave, uh, live, I guess, these standards that we're going to find out in these passages of Scripture are not found in us in the unsubmitted, undedicated Christian. It has to be somebody that's on, that wants to live for God, that has a desire to live for God, that's put other things on the back burner and thinks and believes that living for God is the most important thing they could possibly do. As we look in these, this chapter, we'll, uh, we'll find a few things. We'll find where it says, Pray ye for the leadership of the Holy Ghost of God to live in a happy Christian life. Jesus began his earthly ministry at uh, about 30 years old. The length of time of his ministry was about three and a half years. He did not have thousands following him as disciples. He had thousands that would follow him to eat the loaves and fishes. He had thousands that would follow him to come to hear his different message, but to be a disciple. What is the difference in a disciple and a believer. Well, a believer is somebody that has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay. But a disciple is someone that has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and have taken his teachings and his uh, leadership and are trying to live a life that he's dedicated for us or dictated for us in the Scriptures. It's one that follows the teachings of Christ. I hate to say this, but not every born-again child of God follows him. Thank God that they're saved, but they don't all follow him. Jesus began his earthly ministry, and when he did, man, his popularity just flourished. In Matthew chapter 4, if you look at verse number 23, and uh, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people. <coughs> Look at verse 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. His, this fame drew people from the whole region. And as I said a moment ago, not all of them followed Jesus for the right reason. This is another statement I, I don't like to make, but it's true. Not everybody in the church follows Jesus for the right reason. He's mentioned here that he, they followed him in chapter John 6, that they followed him because you did eat the loaves and were, and were, and were filled. But wait. Let's not be too judgmental on these that are mentioned in John 6 because we ourselves need to be careful and concerned about our motives in following the Lord Jesus. To know and understand our motive, there has to be an unflinching honesty present in us. In other words, we have to do an accept, a self-examination to see, well, well, why am I following him? Why am I really following Jesus? Is it just to check another box? There's a lot of people that are in church this morning for the simple reason of checking the box. I go to church. I'm, I, I go. You can't say anything to me because I, 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 went, I went to church Sunday. Uh, just in case there's others that say, I, I'm going to go there and just in case there's really something about this Bible stuff. There are the others in church that say, 
they're, they're there because if all of, uh, else fails, you know. And there are people that are in church. Now, this is good. I'm not criticizing this one at all. They're there because it's a habit. They're brought up in a home that went to church like I was. And it's a habit. Well, it's got to be more than that. Some people are in church. They want to get out of jail free or rather get out of hell free card. They want to miss hell. Now, that's a good reason. Follow Jesus is to miss hell, but that shouldn't be our great. Then others, He's our hope. He's the hope of our salvation. He's our all in all. He's our Alpha and Omega. He's everything to us. I pray that that's why I follow Him. Who is He to you? And, and we come to the question are you living a happy Christian life? I have a missionary that calls me quite regularly. I reckon I'm his sounding board. But I told him I don't say much to him. I just listen. He is not living a happy Christian life. Things are not going. He's not seeing anything happening in his ministry where he's at and he's serving. And it breaks his heart that he's supposedly spending his time and it seems to him sometimes in a wasteful manner. And maybe it is. I, I really don't know. But I know he's not living a happy Christian life. There's happiness in knowing and living for the Lord Jesus. And I hope we see in the next few weeks what it means. By way of introduction, I want to look at these two verses of Scripture and I want to show you, first of all, there, was, there were people there. <clears throat> Chapter 5 and verse 1 says, And seeing the multitudes. As we study our scripture, and you read your Bible, as a, uh, our Bible reading is marked out in our bulletin every Sunday, you'll find out that in the life of Jesus Christ, There was just something about a multitude that affected him. There was just something about, uh, let me give you an example. When Jesus saw the multitude, he was concerned about the harvest of souls. You can turn in chapter number 9 of the book of Matthew, in verse number 36, and you'll find these words. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Verse 36. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. When Jesus saw multitudes, he saw the possibility of multitudes, a harvest of souls. I wonder, should that not be our look too when we see multitudes? And he saw the multitudes, look in verse, chapter Matthew 14, in verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion before them, or toward them, and he healed their sick. We find he was concerned about the health of the body when he saw a multitude. And, and then in uh Mark chapter 6 and verse 34, the Bible says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd and began to teach them many things. He was concerned about their, he was concerned about the harvest of souls. He was concerned about the health of their body, but he was also concerned about, concerned about the haven of their, where their soul going. He began to teach them many things. <clears throat> and the one thing that you'll find in all three passages that I just mentioned, it was when Jesus saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion. When he saw them, he was compassionate toward them. I have a preference myself, I guess you could say, 
I like to see people in the house of God. I like to see people in the house of God that you can see the old marks of sin on them. It just thrills me to see somebody that's been out in the world and God sowed out the lifeline and rescued them and brought them from a life of sin and <clears throat> made a change in their life. I like that. It thrills my soul. But then again, I love to see somebody that stands and say, well, I never was in this, I never was in that, and I never did this because I got saved at a young age and I've, I've tried my best to live for the Lord all my life. Those are, those are people who have uh, great, great testimonies. But nothing, he's, he looked at them and he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. I've been studying sheep a little bit. They're the dumbest things in the world. I'm not kidding you. Do you know a, de a sheep that lays down and turns over on his back can't get up? He's like a turtle on his back just kicking their feet and that's it. Do you know it's probably the most ill-equipped animal to fend for itself that I know of is a sheep. They have to have to have a shepherd to protect them. They will stand in a, in a big glob and let the wolf kill every one of them and not even run. They can't find shelter for themselves. You take, you take an old goat outside and turn him loose, he'll eat, but he'll come home. He knows where home's at. You take a cow out, they'll find home. You take a horse out. You can even be riding a horse. If you don't know how to get home, just turn him loose. He'll go home. But not a sheep. They can't find a way. That's why it talks about the, the song talks about the 90 and 9 and the one that's lost. He can't find his way home. They're ill-equipped to, to uh, find shelter for themselves. They can't even feed, find food for themselves. That's why you have to have a shepherd. He leadeth me in green pastures. You got to have a shepherd to take care of sheep. And when Jesus sees the multitude, he's moved with compassion on them for they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're defenseless. They have nothing. And also, if you'll notice in the scripture, we as his people are called sheep of his pasture. Nothing is more... And you know what? Many shepherd has given his life for the sheep. Lest we forget whom we're talking about, let me refresh you. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's Isaiah 50, 53, 6. If you don't know the Lord, man, I'm telling you, then you've gone astray. Not only were there people there, but look, if you would, in verse number one and two. There was a preacher there. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Almost exclusively, when a crowd gathered, Jesus preached to them. It should be no surprise for us when we find the Apostle Paul putting such an emphasis on preaching as he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 21. For after that in the wisdom of God he would by wisdom, he would by wisdom uh, knew not God. The world by wisdom, excuse me. For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Paul elaborates about the value God gives in preaching. In chapter number 10, he says this of the book of Romans, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 13. And verse 14 says, And how shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except to be sent? How beautiful, the, as it's written, how beautiful the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings to good, of good things. Preaching is what gets the job done. And here was the, the preacher. Uh, 
I love this church because this church recognizes the importance of preaching the Word of God. Do you know it satisfies God? Even though it's scorned by the world, it satisfies God. And in saving and, and preaching, lost souls are saved. The ministry of the church has got to be built around preaching of the Word of God. I am a, attempting to make an indelible point in our hearts and in our lives this morning that there's got to be preaching. These churches that have the parachurch uh, have traded preaching for performance and uh, the cross is jeopardized. When they, I know I've, I've seen, where was it at? I saw somewhere. The where Brother James is back back there, it was a room and they had all kind of uh, screens and different computers, and they were projecting on the string uh, the screen and they all it was was it was a production is all it was, it was entertainment. Let me tell you, I have been in church, and I have heard preaching that sure did not entertain me. I've had some that scalded my hide. Amen. I've had some that broke my heart. I've had some that's lifted me up. I've had some that's edified me. I've had some that's convicted me. But it sure wasn't entertaining. The scripture, the preaching of the word of God, when you start handling truth like that. And those that are in the parachurch group and that entertainment stuff and all that stuff, they're jeopardizing the souls of men for entertainment. You come and you leave, you get a feel-good church. Oh, Smiley over there, he comes up and talks about living your best life now. I had much rather live my best life in eternity. Amen? Than the few short years we've got here. This is 2024, folks. Can you believe that? I call my brother. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, and wished him happy birthday. He's 77 years old. First thing I said to him, I said, did you ever think you'd be 77? He said, never in my wildest imagination. And he said, I can't wrap my head around it now. I mean, time goes by. People come and go. This is no more than a, this, this, this church thing to some people is no more than a, a social gathering where you meet people and they have lost the value of preaching the word of God. If you study the context and the criteria of Romans chapter 10 verse 14 and 15, it's seen clearly there that without the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hearing of that preaching, there is no salvation outside of it. Now I can say this, please don't get me wrong. You don't have to sit in a church building and hear preaching. You can hear it on a piece of paper. You can get out of a gospel track and open that track and there's preaching in that gospel track sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and you can be saved by hearing that, the printed page. But it's preaching the gospel. It's foretelling the gospel. But this text tells us that not only was there a preacher present, but the preacher was present. I must admit, and I'm going to admit, I've stood behind a pulpit and preached before, and I believe, Brother Job, that God had laid a message on my heart, and I preached that message without any idea, any idea, who the Lord was going to touch with that message or how many he was going to touch that message. I just knew that I was supposed to preach it. That's all. I just knew he burned that in my heart and that's what I was supposed to preach. But that's not present here in this passage of Scripture because this preacher knew who he was preaching to. He knew the condition of their, thought, of their heart. He knew their thoughts. He knew their transgressions. He knew their traditions. He knew all the tragedies of life they had been through. 
And his preaching was revelant to them. His preaching was revealing to them. It opened things up. It was, refre- it was redeeming. It was refreshing also. Do you remember the conclusion reached by those officers that were sent to pick Jesus up by the Pharisees? In John chapter number 7, the Bible says in verse number 32, And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him, talking about Jesus. And then down in verse 45 and 46 it says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The Pharisees and the chief priests were asking the officers. Why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Ain't nobody preaches like this guy. They ain't nobody said anything like this. When Jesus does the preaching, things happen. Just think one of these days we'll be ushered into the very presence of God. And this preacher will get to hear him preach. There'll be preachers. He's the preacher of preachers. I really appreciate the thought of hearing our blessed Lord preach. There were people present. There was a preacher present. Look at verse number one again. And there was some preparation made. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. As any situation that includes a multitude, there's got to be some preparation. I want you to notice the location he went. He went up into a high mountain. Into a mountain, rather. I misquoted that. He went up into a mountain. The Lord, knowing that he's going to be preaching to a multitude, he wanted to get a place where he could, his voice would carry. And he knew that he was able to speak to them more if he was up above them and speaking down to a place. And the location, but the Bible says there was some preparation too. And when he was set, when he's got everything fixed up, many times in biblical times, the rabbis, when they preached or taught, they didn't stand behind a pulpit like we do, walk around like I do. They would sit down. And teach the people. And this is what Jesus did. It gives an insight of the fact that Jesus wanted to make a good impression on these people. He wanted everything set. He didn't begin. That word when everything was, was set means to settle. In other words, when the location was right, we got everything settled up, he was ready to preach. And, his, and the invitation was his disciples came to him. There are times... When he invites the disciples, but he not only invited his disciples then or they came to him rather, but the multitude did also. But there are times in the scripture where Jesus just took his disciples apart, just them. I'm sorry to say this, but I know the Lord longs for our presence, but... I believe we miss entering into his presence a lot of times because of our location where we're at. We're not in a place conducive of of communicating with our blessed Lord. But here Jesus was conscious of his location. And we miss entering into his presence at times because of our lack of preparation. There are prerequisites to enter into before the Lord. Unconfessed sin will block our communion with Him. I think it's Psalm 66, maybe 64, where it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord not hear me. Unreserved time blocks our communion with Him. Do you think he wants to compete with a program on television? I love college football. 
I don't care anything about the NFL. They started putting their knee on the ground when the national anthem was played. That done me in. I'm through with that crowd. I like college football. And when my team's playing, I try to make time to be sure that I'm there to watch, watch the game. I'm talking about me now. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. But I find it very difficult for me to set a certain time aside to have communion with my Lord. It seems like everything in the world comes up. Seems like everything happens. I don't have to worry about the dishwasher. It broke a long time ago. <laughs> but it seems like something always comes up. But if it's football game, now, I'm going to be sure that I'm there. I think it's not only of our, our unconfessed sin that blocks our communion with Him, but I think sometimes our not reserving time, unreserved time, will block our communication with Him. And then sometimes we just need a place, a special place where we get along with God. Just you and him. My wife used to go to the bathroom and take her Bible where she could shut herself in and lock herself in and study and pray. She don't do that now because I have to take Lasix and I got to go to the bathroom. So she got, she's had to find her another place. That's confession, y'all. <clears throat> I messed her up there. But there ought to be a specified place where we find a place alone with God. Well, I've had some great times with him. Just me and him. And to thank Brother Tim that God would come down and just visit with just you. Oh, man, it's wonderful. But he'll do that. Our life is a snatch and grab society right now. We run from one thing to another. And Brother James was talking about how we get caught up in a rat race. And sometimes it's not even our rats that's running, but we'll be running up with them. We're not really that hurry, but we get out and everybody's running and pushing hard on the road and trying to get there. And before long, we're pushing and trying to pass and do it. And we're really not that pressed. We were running from one thing to another. We don't set time about to communicate with him. We miss entering into his presence because we've just forgotten his invitation he's given to us. He's given us an open invitation. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. First Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Matthew 11 and verse number 28, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden's light. I hope you see that the time spent with God really deserves and demands some preparation that we stop everything. We close everything down for a little while. Just give him. I think that's one reason why that little bulletin and that that Bible reading on the, in the bulletin will be so helpful for us. We'll just do that and let it stop. Wait a minute, I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop. i got to read my Bible. Sometimes we just have to be pushed in the corner. Just pushed in the corner. I've got to do this. And then after we get there, we're so, so thankful that we have been. We've seen the people. We've seen the preacher. We've seen the preparation. And then we see the presentation. We won't get into it, but I'll just show you the preparation he's made for the presentation. The Bible says in verse number 2, 5, 2, that he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are. <clears throat> I've often long, uh, wondered and longed 
to hear the Lord open the scriptures and preach. I've heard some great men of God preach. Great men of God. I've heard Jack Hiles preach. I've heard Dr. Robertson preach many times. One of my favorite preachers is Dr. B.R. Lakin. He's gone. So are all the rest of them. C.L. Roach. I love to hear Dr. C.L. Roach preach. One of my favorite men and one of my heroes is J.E. Glass. I love to hear J.E. Glass preach. Harold Seitler. I believe Harold Seitler grunts with most of the Holy Ghost on him and some people preach with. I just heard him the other day. I, somebody put a little clip in it uh, in, on Facebook, I think it was. And he said, uh, he said, uh, John Calvin. He said, I'm not. John Calvin hated me, hated my people. So say I'm a Calvinist. He said, I'm not a Calvinist. He said, I'm a Baptist and proud to be a Baptist because a Calvinist is a Protestant. I'm not a Protestant. I'm a Baptist. And I thought, thank God, me too. That's what I am. I'm a Baptist. John Calvin hated us, persecuted us. Harold Seitler, S.M. Lock, S.M. Lockridge. I never heard him personally, but I've heard him a bunch of times on tape. Man, what a preacher. Sammy Allen, I'll never forget the first time I heard Brother Sammy preach. He came to preach over in Talking Rock. We were trying to start a church over there. And we had him come over for a, for a revival. <clears throat> we had two sets of pews. I sat on this side front pew because I led the singing and everything and I need to be right there on the front so I sit right there on the front if anybody's heard Brother Sammy preach you know how he preaches he's, he's, he's past wild to wall he come down through there preaching to me and he, get, and he got, got right in my face oh that's not anything he's preached me he rode me around on his, on his back one time and I was the, I was the wait and sin that does season to beset you that's what he's preaching about this time he was preaching, he come right down there, and I'm sitting there with my Bible open, and he's preaching right in my face, preaching right in my face, and he turned around and leaves, and it looked like I'd been under a sprinkler. He almost ruined my Bible. I mean, the sweat running off of him and dripped on my Bible, and that pages were messed up for the longest. The next time he come over, I put my thumb in my Bible and shut it where it sweat on the back and not the inside of it. I've heard Brother Sammy preach, and the power of God on him. S.M. Lockridge. I've heard Lister Roloff preach. I've heard Harvey Ware preach, my brother. I've heard John R. Rice. One of the men that, bothered, that, that helped shape my life was Dr. James Rainwater. Probably a lot of the people, these I've named, you don't know. Some of them you do. Nevertheless, they were great men of God. However, what it must have been like to sit at his feet. At his feet. To hear the voice that the angels responded to. To hear the voice that commanded the stars to be put in place and they were there. To hear the voice that spoke creative words and everything that we've seen and things we have not yet seen and may never see in this life came into existence just because he said so. To have heard the voice that spoke the, <clears throat> the prophecies to the prophets as they pinned down things that would happen thousands of years later. Hundreds and hundreds and then sometimes thousands. To have heard the voice that the authors and preachers and people like me try to even to explain and in vain to do so have heard the voice that the songwriters without success try to give praise that it's worthy of. To have heard him preach and he sat down and said blessed and started the Beatitudes. He got everything fixed up. Got everything set right. And yet here we are in this local assembly 
listening to the word of God and trying to give insight to it. Jesus opens his mouth and taught them, here's how to be a happy Christian. Here's how to have the greatest joy in your life. Here's how to have happiness. And he, said, and he, and he tells us it's not really the pleasantries of life. It's not possessions. People think happiness. Well, happiness has to do with happenings a lot of times. But this happiness we're talking about goes beyond a happenings. It goes beyond that. It is a, it's a joy. It's a, I wish I could tell you what it really means. I, I can't seem to find the words. Now, you'll look it up in your dictionary and it'll, talk, it'll say happy. But it's more than that. It's, it's living a life and knowing that God is in agreement with the way you're living and in agreement with what's happening in your life. And you know that you're having the smile of God on you and on your life and he's, he's definitely in agreement with the way you're living. That's, uh, that's the best I can to bring this blessed into perspective to try to get us up. The things that are meaningful now or for those things that we're really laying up in heaven. We should be living here for over there. Hearing that still small voice that called me to salvation was a wonderful thing. We need to listen intently to that still small voice because he'll still speak to you. If we're one that needs to be given more attention to the preaching of all preachers, we need to listen to his instructions and obey him. Maybe you're one that needs to give the preparation to his presence to get everything stopped and slowed down and quiet and a place where you can read the scriptures and pray and not have the interruption. Do you know, I want to show you something a lot of people don't understand. It has an off button. You can turn it off. And the world will still rotate the sun will still shine. Amen. The world will not stop if you turn it off. And I'm saying that as much to me as I am to you. There are times when you say, I, have you ever left your phone and went, oh no, what am I going to do? I don't have my phone. You're going to go about your business like you always did. Unless you're addicted to it and you have to run back home. Get it. I don't know about you. I can't speak to you and I'm about through. But I long to hear his voice. I long for him to speak to me. And I have to say this, and I'm going to say it honestly. There are times, because it's not all the time, and I'm sorry to say that, that I really long for his presence. Sometimes I'm so busy where I don't even pay attention to it. But there's times when I don't long for his presence. But I long for him to speak to me. And you know, brothers and sisters, every time we open this book, he speaks to me. This is his word. This is what he wants you to know about him. This right here. That's why it's so important. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him and they opened his mouth 
and taught them, saying, Blessed are ye. And it went right on down through the scriptures. We'll look at these as we do our study. And I pray that the Lord will help us see some things in here that will help our, us in our Christian life. Because they're wonderful, wonderful scriptures. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time you've given us together. I want to be a happy Christian, Lord. The ones the Bible's talking about. And for me to do that, one of the prerequisites, I've got to spend some time listening to your voice and talking with you and communicating with you. Reading the Word of God and praying. And I pray that we'd prepare ourselves for just that, but for the church, for services, for a life that has the blessings of God on it. Bless, I pray, this service today. We've set aside this time, Lord, to come to meet with you. You don't have to meet with us, Lord. We sure do want you to. We, even, we invite you to come into our presence with the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Teach us, show us, open our eyes. Admonish us, rebuke us where we're wrong, Lord. And help us conform ourselves unto you. So we can be a blessed Christian. Bless our pastors, he preaches, the song service and everything that takes place. And we'll thank you and bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.